Good morning, good morning. Good to see you guys. Great to see you on the stream this morning. Glad to have you here as we're here to worship the true and the living God. And we're glad to be able to get together and to gather. And uh, if you're gathering with us online today, we're glad to have you with us there. And glad to see all of you who are here. And uh, it's nice to have the weather getting a little warmer, though it's not been as warm as I had hoped. But we'll get there. So I'm going to open with some prayer. We'll sing a little. Actually, I'll open in prayer. We'll and uh, we'll do some announcements and kind of dive into our morning. Let's look to our Lord in prayer. Good morning, Father. Lord, we just thank you so much for the chance to just come together, whether we're online this morning, whether we're here in person, to be able to come together and to, to recognize that you have made us as a body, brought us together as your body, as your people, uh, to be a witness for you, to be... Uh, caring for one another, to uphold one another, to strengthen one another, and to reach out to those around us that they would know your grace, love, mercy, your sacrifice on the cross so that we might know you and understand how much you love us. So Lord, just be with our time this morning as we celebrate and recover from a week of being out in the world and, and being lights and being salt and being a witness. And as we prepare for the week ahead and as and renewed and prepared to be your church as we go out, as we live among our friends and neighbors, as we uh, live among the community, and as we try to be encouragements and ambassadors for your love, grace, and mercy, proclaiming the good news that we would see others touched by your great love and sacrifice. So Lord, just be with our time as we get together this morning and as we prepare for a week of ministry. And Lord, just thank you for the chance to share in each other's lives, the joys, the sorrows, the burdens, and the opportunities. So Lord, just be with us this morning. We're so thankful that we can gather together and know that you are here with us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start with singing Our God Reigns. So uh, feel free to sing out as we sing Our God Reigns this morning. How love me on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness, our God reigns. should be drawn to him. He was despised, and we took no account of him. Yet now he reigns with the most
just some announcements. So first, if you play a musical instrument and would like to join us, uh, come talk to me. And uh, we're working on getting things uh, more in place for that. If you're interested in helping with the children's ministry and uh, with Children's Church, also uh, get in touch with me or you can get in touch with Jen Brosey or uh, Cody or Beth and we'll get you started on the path for working that out. As uh, all these things are in the, in the rebirth stage, and uh, we'd love to have your help. We need volunteers. We need people who are willing to come along and serve, so uh, feel free to reach out if you'd like to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are food boxes. Are, are there still food boxes? Yes, okay. There are still food boxes out in the entryway, and uh, so if you're interested in taking one of those, it's from the Healthy Coalition, and uh, so just they'll be out there, and I think somebody will help you because there's some stuff that's in the free fridge or freezer, I believe. Uh, they're doing prayer meetings again on a prayer gathering, really, on Fridays at 10 o'clock down in the big Sunday school classroom, just up the, up the ramp and down the hall to the big classroom. And uh, they meet at 10 o'clock on Fridays if you'd like to come. And they usually pray first and then do some also just visiting and stuff. And, uh, but if you need to get out, uh, you don't have to stay and visit, but that's an awesome time of fellowship as well. We've just wrapped up our communities, and we will be launching more in a little bit, uh, but right now we're on a little bit of a hiatus as we get ready for the next round of that. We are doing shepherding training. If you're an existing shepherd, uh, they did have a meeting this morning to watch the video uh, at 9.30, and a uh, chance to do that together and, and talk, but there'll be a link coming out in the next day or so to watch that. And uh, in a couple weeks, the Sunday after Mother's Day, which I think is two weeks from today, because is next week Mother's Day, next Sunday Mother's Day, yeah? So two weeks from today, there will be a shepherding in-person meeting um, at 3 o'clock here, and because uh, we've hit the halfway point of the existing shepherding meeting. We also are doing new shepherd training, which if you didn't get a link and you think you were supposed to, uh, I think I might have missed some people, so just reach out to me on that as we are equipping more shepherds as we serve each other and take care of each other. I think that's everything I've got. Yes? May 15th. There's a work day at the Farmington Conference Center. Come when you can. Leave when you can. There is a lunch. And uh, I think Greg's actually cooking the lunch. And uh, so if you'd like to help out with that, that's right up here, uh, just past the Farmington Baptist Church, if you'd like to help out with that as a... Uh, they're getting ready for their summer camp program. And uh, so that's, I've totally forgotten about that. I had a little fun yesterday, no, wait, today's Sunday, because you're all here, so that makes sense. All right, so yeah, was it yesterday morning? Uh, the bike thing? Yeah, boy, you know, time just has no meaning now, right? So yesterday morning, uh, I participated in my first ever uh, Blessing of the Bikes in a local motorcycle club. And it was cold and windy, and they had never done it before either, so we didn't have a lot of bikes. I had plenty of blessing left over, <laughs> so if you need one later, come over, and if you can make a motorcycle noise, I'll let you have one of them. No, it was a great time, awesome people. It was fun to just share with them a few minutes and uh, encourage them and pray for them, and uh, so that was neat, and then they went on and had the rest of their day, and uh, so a lot of cool things. I got my second shot on Wednesday, so I had all kinds of other adventures too, so that was fun, but I'm here and upright and doing good now, so on Thursday it was a little different, but hey, so I think that's all right, so uh, Joey and Tracy are going to come, and uh, we're going to sing, and Olivia, sorry, she wasn't here, I've totally forgotten about her, so it's awful, did you get music? Let it rise. Talking about resurrection, so it seems appropriate.
Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise.
the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. singing. I can hear you guys. That's great. I think I'm losing my voice right in the middle of that. I'm like, <laughs> all right, we're going to have the children's message, I believe now. Hey guys, how are you doing? I have a little quiz for you, a little something to see what you think. All right, I'm going to show you some things. I want you to figure out and see if you can say what? I'm going to show you some things. Which one is the apple? Okay. So here's the first one. Okay. Can you see that? It's kind of small, kind of tiny. Is that an apple? Or maybe this is an apple. Is this an apple? Maybe this is an apple. Is this an apple? Maybe this. Is this an apple? Or how about this? Is this an apple? So which one, which one is it? Now, you probably said this one and this this is an apple. This obviously is a pear. An orange. That's orange. This is a giant blueberry. But then that first one I showed you, one that's hard to pick up. This is actually an apple too. But it's not an apple like this is an apple. This is a seed. It's hard to even show it to you. It's so it's tiny. So you couldn't eat this like you can eat an apple, right? Because this is just a seed. Now, if I plant this in the ground, what I should get, right, is, uh, will, an, will an apple just grow? <laughs> no, no, right? It won't grow an apple. It'll grow an apple tree. And then the apple tree will grow the apple. So this little thing, again, it's so hard to show you because it's so tiny. I have a hard time holding it. So this little thing here will grow a tree, great big tree that will grow this great big apple. And this is a lot bigger than that little seed. I can hold this. You can see this easy. And so, yeah, they're, they're the same, but they're really different too. Now, we oftentimes think about, you ever think about going to heaven? You ever think about that? Maybe you don't think about it much, but sometimes we think about what's going to be like in the future when we go to heaven. Well, we're going to have a different body. Yeah, we're going to have a different body when we go to heaven. What is it going to be like? Well, it might be like the fact that this and this are the same but different. They're both an apple. But there, there's more to it than that, right? Well, sometimes we just think that we're going to go to heaven and be just like we are now. Does that mean that when I go to heaven, I'll still have gray hair 
When you go to heaven, will you be a little? Will you be little and I'll be big? You'll be young and I'll be older? Or will it be really, really different? Well, the Bible says it's kind of going to be really, really different. And we don't know exactly what it'll be like, but we know that it'll be really different. And that's exciting to me because it means, you know, just because if there's things about me I, I don't like now or the fact that, you know, my hair's turning all gray and sometimes it's like getting a little less on top, that, that's okay because God's going to give me a body that doesn't get boo-boos and doesn't get hurt, doesn't get all tired, doesn't get sick. Oh, that sounds really good, doesn't it? And so that gives me something to look forward to. And that makes me really excited. So I don't know what it's exactly going to be like in the future. But I know it's going to be really cool. And that gives me something to look forward to. So I hope that's an, a fun thought today. And I hope you had fun with my fruit. And I hope that you have a great week. And I love you very much. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. You're not supposed to laugh when I mention the hair. Charlene's going to come and read our scripture for today. Oh, and the children can go. Sorry. Children may go to children's church. <laughs> Charlene's like, send the kids. First Corinthians 15, 35 through 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown as in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As he was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Thank you very much, Charlene. We are in part three of our series, What's Coming, looking at the resurrection. And as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, even though I've been doing this for a while now and grew up in the church, uh, I had never myself taught in depth on the resurrection, nor had I ever heard in-depth teaching of the resurrection. Every Easter we talked about the reality of the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection, the hope of the resurrection, but as far as getting kind of into the, the reality and, and what it looks like and what it means, that well, was kind of an Easter thing. So this has been very interesting. I've been learning a lot, and I found it very helpful. But let's just quickly recap our first two weeks. In part one, we talked about the fact that the story of the resurrection that we find in the Bible, if you were going to make up a story, if you are going to create a story that you wanted people to believe, especially first century Jewish people, uh, the story in the Bible is not the story you would create. It is not a story that is created to be believable in the sense that it's not it's not built to make it easy to believe. It's not the story you would write if you were trying to make something up. Starting with the fact that the first eyewitnesses were women in a culture that did not value the word of women. So you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't try to convince a bunch of Jews that the resurrection 
was taking place already when they believed that was something that would happen much later, and you would not try to talk about God actually becoming a human being. So the whole point of the resurrection is the only reason you would ever create this story and have a bunch of Jews tell it is if it really happened. So we talk about the fact the resurrection of Jesus, the only real explanation for the accounts of it is because it really happened, it is real. And so then last week we talked about that now if there is a resurrection to come as well, that it changes the motives in how I live now. Because just like with any kind of, you know, when you make plans or you make do financial planning or stuff like that, you, you think about, well, what's coming? What do I need to be ready for? And if there is a whole bunch more life coming, if, if it's more than just right now, well, then you plan that way. You plan with the future in mind so that you're ready for it. And so we talked last week that if the resurrection is real, well, then it matters what I do now because I don't want to invest my life in things that are not going to last into the future. So I want to live in such a way that I am preparing for the future. It changes the motives of my life now. Now, one of the beautiful things that the internet has done is it has managed to gather together our, our corporate mankind's ignorance and make it so more readily accessible to us. And so now we can more freely share all the things that we don't know and share them so others won't know them either. And that is the beauty of the internet. And we can find a lot of really amazing things online and arguments and stuff like that. So when I was studying the resurrection, I did a little Googling. And I found a website that was devastating. We're going to show that those stupid people, those dumb Christians, they'll read this and their arguments will be in tatters. <laughs> so I was like, ooh, I want to read this. Because I enjoy stuff like that. Because, hey, if I believe the truth, it ought to be able to survive a web page. So I start reading this web page, and I was a little disappointed. Um, I didn't really, not only didn't I shatter, but I didn't really even crack. Um, but they were, but they were like, they got to the end of it and said, see? So that's why resurrection's stupid. And I'm like, well... You didn't really make it, but nice try, you know, good job. But their big thing was, well, they think that the body is going to come back, but what about cremation? And even if you don't cremate the body, I mean, after a couple thousand years, it's just a pile of dust anyway, so that body can't come back. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I'd already thought of that one. But then I realized that Maybe that wasn't so stupid after all. Because maybe you've heard that argument. Maybe you've wondered that yourself. And I, I remembered, the first time I had to make the decision was when Dad passed away. And I remember, it gave me pause. And so then I'm like, well, maybe they're, maybe they're not so stupid to bring that up as something that might bother people. And maybe you've asked, well, what about the fact that, you know, these bodies, you know, and is it wrong to cremate? And there are people who believe that, boy, you should not ever... You know, the whole move towards crema cremation is wrong because how's God going to bring that back, you know? And then what about the fact, and this is what they brought up on the website, what about the fact that, you know, these people who lived 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago, some of their atoms may be in someone else. Well, then what, then what do you do? Like, give me my atom back. No, that's mine. You know, I mean, how, how do we rebuild that? So then I was like, well, maybe. But if you had asked me about it, I'd have said, well, don't worry, God's got it figured out. But despite the fact that I've been at this a while, I did not realize that Paul answered the question really well. Like, specifically. Did you know that? If you did, then where you been? Because I've needed you for a while. So let's look at it, because Charlene read this. Let's look at it. He starts in verse 35 of 1 Corinthians 15. And he starts by asking the question that we may have asked, not others have asked. But someone will say, how are the dead raised, and what kind of body do they come? So there it is. He's been, we, I mean, we already 
We were studying this passage last week. He says, but some will ask, well, how does that work? And what does the body look like? I'm like, exactly. Thank you, Paul. You're asking the question that I'm asking. I don't like his answer. When he and I see each other, we may need to chat. Verse 36, you fool. He says, that's a stupid question. Thanks a lot, Paul. I'm just asking, you fool. Well, why does he say that? Let's look. He says, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. And so what Paul is saying, he doesn't say, well, you're dumb to ask that question. He's like, why, why are you, why does this not make sense to you? This is a simple question. It's not that it's a stupid question, but it's a question you should already know the answer to. And he gives a really straightforward, really straightforward answer. So whenever you're going to read a passage and study this on your own, which you should do, one of the big important things to do is first, make sure you get a whole passage together. Sometimes we divide these passages up way too short. We study individual verses, and it's really easy to get them out of context, and then we don't get what they're saying. You need to get the author's whole thought, which here is 35 through 49. He, answers the, he asks the question, and he spends a bunch of time unpacking it. So you need to take the whole thing at once. Then, once you know you've got a section, then look for the main verse or the main phrase that is what that section's about. Here, it's verse 37. That which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps the wheat of something else. That is a simple answer. Because if you have ever planted anything, you already knew that. And that was what the children's message was about. If you want an apple tree, you do not put an apple tree in the ground. You put an apple seed in the ground. If you want to grow something, you don't put the plant in the ground, you put the seed in the ground and the plant comes out of it. If you want to grow an oak tree, you don't go find an oak tree and stick an oak tree in the ground and bury it. You'll just have some rotten oak wood. You take an acorn. And he says, well, you guys know that. When you want to grow wheat, you don't go find a stalk of wheat and plant it. You just you take the bare grain. He goes, so why are you asking about what your new body's going to be like? You don't plant what you're going to get. You plant a seed. So how do you not understand that? And I'm like, oh, you're right. It was a dumb question, Paul. And now he's going to spend the whole rest of this passage, and we're going to go through it with him, illustrating and explaining that verse. What does it mean for us to understand that this is a seed? Because that's what he said. Verse 38, but God gives it, the seed, a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds, a body of its own. He says, so the simple answer, you don't sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, a seed, and God gives a body as he wishes. God creates something new. You plant an acorn, you don't grow acorns, you grow oak trees. You plant an apple seed, you don't even grow an apple. You grow an apple tree, which produces apples, which produces seeds. God creates something new out of it. So then he spends the next section illustrating and explaining his point. Help us understand it. It's pretty, very straightforward. Once you start listening to him, it's like this is actually not a, not a weird passage at all. It's very, very straightforward and real life normal. So look, verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. So he says, well, we have different kinds of flesh bodies. You know, we have human bodies, and cat bodies, and dog bodies, and fish bodies, and bird bodies. Because they're not all the same. And then verse 40, there are different heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earth is a different one. He says, and... There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and the stars are different from each other. That one's a bright one, that one's kind of a dim one. 
goes, so you have different bodies, flesh? You have different bodies, celestial? He goes, so why is this complicated? Verse 42, he goes, so also, just like you're used to the fact that there are different kinds of bodies here, whether it be physical bodies or celestial bodies, he goes, so also is the resurrection of the dead. So the thing you're wondering about, it's the same way. It's a different kind of body. It is sown a perishable body. It's raised in imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in natural. It's raised spiritual. Because when Paul, and if you read a lot of Paul, you'll see this is his normal tendency. Paul's a teacher, and he was a good teacher, and he was a smart teacher. So when Paul takes a point, he doesn't like put the point in the ground and go tap. He puts the point in the ground and goes boom, 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 boom. Got it now? <laughs> so that's why he says, okay, let's talk about different kinds of bodies. Humans, animals, fish, birds. Got that so far? Uh-huh. All right, let's keep going. Planets, stars, sun, moon. Got that? Yeah. So like that. And let me give you four illustrations of that. Perishable, imperishable. Dishonor, honor. Weak, powerful. Natural, spiritual. It's like it's just, his whole point of the way through here, it's going to be different. And then, there in verse 44, as he uses the last difference of being, the difference between natural and and spiritual, then he says, and let me explain that. So in verse 44, he says, now if there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, at first we go, that sounds weird. It's not. Just listen. Very, it's simple. He's using simple language. This is not, you don't need a secret decoder ring. It just strikes your ears weird. Part of it's because it's a translation. But he says, so let me talk about, he goes, because he's talking about the template for what we have now versus the template for what we're going to get. The first Adam, Adam, and the second Adam, Jesus. He says, now, the first Adam... He was, think about creation. He's going back to Genesis. How did God make the first Adam? Start with mud, right? He made the body. He created Adam's body out of dirt. Now, the body wasn't alive yet. It wasn't Adam yet. Until what? Until God took that body and breathed his spirit into it and gave it a spiritual dimension, and he becomes Adam. So Adam starts by being made out of the stuff of this earth and then is given a spiritual dimension that finishes him. Jesus starts as what? A spirit. And then he is given a body. That's all he's saying. He's saying the first one, the first Adam became a living soul. The second one became a life-giving spirit. He's talking about two different orders of creation here. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Adam came first. The first life is born out of the natural, but the second life is born out of the spiritual. And of course, he's tagging all kinds of other things that Jesus had talked about, like you must be born again because there's one birth and a different birth. And that you don't have full life unless you've had both. But our first birth is the physical. That's why we take the life in the womb so seriously. Because when the body is formed, there's a spiritual component of that. But it starts with the what? The physical. That's the first. That's the template. And that's why we care about what happens in the womb. Because it's a, it's a human life. But this next life starts with the spiritual. 
The first man, verse 7, so now he's, what he, this is just another, he's just driving the point home. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthly, verse 48, so also are those who are earthly. And as is the heavenly, so are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we'll also bear the image of the heavenly. And so what he says is now all of us, where did we all come from? We all came from our parents. That's how that works. If you have questions, come see me after. And I'm going to refer you to someone else. <laughs> I'm sure somebody, somebody will be getting a phone call. And that's why, because what does the earthly come from? the earthly. He says, so all of us right now, we bear the mark. That's why I look like my folks, especially my dad. And that's why my kids look like us. You look like where you came from. He says, now, in the new, the origin is different. And we'll look like where that comes from. Because that's what he's been saying all along. It's different. It's a different kind of body. It's not the same body redone. It's a different one. What you plant in the ground is not what grows. And the first body that we started with came out of Adam. It came out of the ground. And the new body, this one's coming from the Spirit. I'm way behind. So he says... The natural will replace the spiritual. The natural started, and then it's replaced with spiritual or new. So now, a way we can put this, as he talks about the natural and the spiritual, is what he's talking about is a body adapted to the environment. And the new body will be adapted to a new environment. Those were earthly, earthy. Those are heavenly, heavenly. And we'll come back to this point in a minute. But our bodies are designed for where we live. And we were given a body that was made out of the earth to live on the earth. And live on this earth. And that's what our body is. But it, our body has a spiritual dimension to it. But it's going to change. So let's, let's I'll come back to this by going through the application here. So our first point of application, our first bring this together is our future bodies will be based on these bodies the same way a plant is based on a seed and that we ask well what will I look like how old will I be will I still have this scar and Paul's like well that's dumb it's like looking at the acorn to try to figure out what the tree looks like you know you don't look at the seed to figure out what the fruit is we know we can say well I know this is going to grow into this but that's only because you've seen the final product he says, so you don't plant the same thing that grows. It's related. And so this is why, you know, because I think we almost have this unconscious, unconscious picture that the resurrection is going to be Jesus with jars. All right, uh, bring out Evan here. All right, do you have the box cover? Oh, wait. We're missing some pieces. I think, I think they're in Sue. Yeah, because Evan was like 2,000 years before Sue. Check her thing. What are we going to do? Which puzzle do we finish? Do you have any super glue? I mean, no! We're not going to be... And that's why we have to... Uh, well, what about cremation? Is what, well, that mess got up. God's like, oh man, they burned the puzzle. <laughs> oh... Guys, what are we going to do here? This jar of ashes. He says, I'm not building the same thing. That's what it said. It says, God, verse 38, God gives it a body as he wished. God's like, it's the relationship of a seed to the plant. So don't, don't worry about your seed so much. He's not rebuilding this. 
And so that brings us to our second point. Our future bodies will be created by God, not reassembled from this one. Oh, thank goodness. Do you get the phone calls? We've been trying to reach you about your car's warranty. I'm like, my car is older than my children. There is no one on the planet with a warranty for this car. Now, if they called up and said, we're trying to reach you about your warranty, I'd take the call. I, I, I need some cash here. We have some overhauls that need to happen. It's making a funny noise when it goes uphill. It doesn't start well. Yeah, there's lots of issues with the mechanicals going on here in this flesh. But he says, no, I'm going to give you something new. It's going to be based on this, but our future bodies will not be a reassembling of this one. So if you've had your hip replaced, I'm sorry, you probably don't get to keep it. I wonder what the new pastor's going to be like. I'm probably going to be out of here. Here's the big one for me. Our future bodies will be adapted to a different way of life. And that's what he's saying all the way through this. Like I said, this, he's just very clear. And when I read through this, I'm like, wow, he just makes a really coherent, simple, straightforward argument. Like the Bible was meant to be understood. Whoa, who knew? We currently live in a natural body that's part of a natural world that includes death, disease, corruption, toil, survival. And I don't just mean death like we're all going to die. I mean, that's true, too. If you didn't know that, come see me. I'll explain that one. The birth thing will let someone else do, but I'll do death, fine. But I have a friend, I have a friend on uh, Twitter who, a uh, pastor friend, yesterday he absolutely devastated his very young daughter. Uh, devastated her to the point that she was out in the yard on her knees, wailing. Because you know what he did? He mowed the lawn. And she had warned him not to. Don't do it, Dad! But he mowed it. And all that poor grass cut down in its prime. And don't even get her started about the dandelions. Those poor things. And he goes, my daughter is out in the yard right now, weeping over the destruction of the lawn. I'm like, wow. He goes, I've got a sensitive daughter. I'm like, yeah, you do. Wow. But why? Because it's death. And we're always dying, right? I don't mean we're one day closer to death. I mean, that's why most of us hopefully took a shower in the last 24, 48 hours. If you don't, we'll begin to know that you've been dying because we'll <laughs> sense it. Because we're constantly dying. The only thing that happens as we get older is our ability to resist, to, uh, re to, to replace the part that's dying diminishes. But even, even babies stink, right? <laughs> because they're dying. Because death is just part of this world and we're adapted to it. We're adapted to death. We keep compost. Great for the garden. What's that? Death and rot. It's great stuff. Our lives are adapted to this and the new life won't be. Toil. Life here is hard work. The Bible's full of that teaching. Life here is hard. You work a full day and you're worn out. You go home. I'll go home, sit on the couch. I'm not a napper. But I'll sit on the couch, and then, I don't know, suddenly there's this time jump. And it's an hour later. And apparently, during that time, weird noises, I don't know. Our new body will be adapted to the new reality, where there won't be toil and death and sickness. And so we'll have a body, because the first body was adapted to natural but the second body was adapted to the spiritual. And instead of being a physical body that was given a spirit, we will be a spirit that is given a new body. And that's what he says explicitly. That's the difference between the first Adam and the second. So the Bible doesn't give details about that body. See, then we start wanting, well, tell me more. 
Well, the Bible doesn't give the details. Other than in the Gospels, we get a quick glimpse of Jesus' body after he rose from the dead. But they were kind of distracted, so they let us down. You know, what you really should have had the disciples do is, so Jesus said, this is cool, can we have a blood sample? I'd love to see, we got to put over in the lab and check, we wonder what your blood looks like after you've risen from the dead. What's the, how does the biology of the new body work? <laughs> no, they were just like, he's back, yay! You know, they just totally missed the chance to do some science. But we know a few things. We know that the body that Jesus got on coming back, that they didn't always recognize him, but then they did. So it was a different, but it wasn't different. Now, we are just so, we get so religious, we get dumb. Oh, gee, why couldn't they recognize him? Have you never been around, like, people? I mean, we just had a year where some people we didn't see in a year. And depending on what, where they are in the stage of life, because you're kind of, if you're in that middle, sensible middle, you don't really transform that much. But on either end, you can change a lot. In just a year. I mean, my kids went from this tall to this tall. And I, well, we won't talk about the changes happening on the other side of that bell curve, but you go, oh, wow. I shared a picture with a friend from college. He was a good friend. Was a good friend. Because <laughs> he sent a picture and I sent a picture, and I went, wow, you haven't changed a bit. He wrote back, you have. Like, thank you. You know, I get new friends. That's great. Um, friends from my church I grew up in came and visited two years ago. I walked right by and had no idea who they were. Didn't know them. Why? Because they got a resurrection body and I just didn't know. No, they just, it's, their body changed. And that's what he says. It's just going to be different. And so will we recognize each other? Maybe not at first. Because we can do that here. But even if I look different from when I was 18 to when I'm, uh, you know, older... I'm still me. And when I get a resurrected body and you get a resurrected body, maybe when we bump into each other, we won't immediately recognize because the last time I saw you, you had a mask on. <laughs> but after a couple of minutes, we'll figure it out. And that's what happened with Jesus, right? And then he wasn't a ghost because they thought he was a ghost. He said, do you have any fish? Give me some fish. Let me eat. See, I'm not a ghost. I'm real. And he walked with them. And when they walked with them, they just thought he was another guy. They didn't even know he had a new body. But then they locked themselves in a room because they were afraid of Romans, and so they're all in this room with the doors locked, so they just went, hey guys, and went, ah! And he came and went without unlocking the room. So, boy, that's different. So we just get these glimpses to say, the body's different. Well, how different? We don't know. But it's a body that's based on the spiritual, but it is a body. And so the only details the Bible gives us is those quick glimpses of Jesus' life after he rose from the dead. And that's all we got. And that's fine. I don't think we need more. So the big question I ask every week, we're almost done. The big question I ask every week is, so what? Now, we need to learn the Bible. <clears throat> but one of the things that really I think is most important is that as we learn the Bible, we also know what does it mean for us as we get out of church and get out of church service and go be the church and live our lives. And, you know, I don't know what your life looks like. Um, I won't say normal life because I've met most of you. And normal's not a word we should be throwing around a lot. Um, definitely not one that applies to me. But some of you have a more standard issue life as far as you go to work and for you know and have a work schedule and stuff like that. Or maybe you have school or you're in retirement or whatever. But what, on Tuesday, as you figure out what your day looks like on Tuesday, what does this mean? Last week we talked about the, how you choose to live your week and the decisions you make should be based on the fact that there's more than just now. But what about this? And I think this is what I came up with, that the nature of our future body doesn't really matter that much right now as far as what are you going to choose to do on Tuesday. But the fact that there is a reality that does matter. What my future body is going to look like doesn't really matter. That's why I don't have to worry about if you cremate me or not. God's got my future body all taken care of. The fact that I have a future body coming, that matters. 
And the biggest way I think it matters is hope and comfort. That we can find hope and comfort in the future restoration. As the birthdays have piled up, and I know some of you guys have been collecting birthdays longer than me, so yeah, you have a bigger collection, okay. But as you pile them up, you become a little more aware of it's a limited collection. And it changes how you think. And when things don't work the same way. So I have a friend who's a pastor over in, I got to go back and look, because I can never remember, Scotland or Ireland, one of the two. And he's, he's younger than me. But he wrote an article recently about the resurrection, because he wrote it, and I was like, dude, I'm getting ready to preach on this. Thank you. And his article was about what he had learned about the resurrection from his church members, because he has a church that's predominantly older people who are elderly, like not just older, but elderly. And he said, as I talk to them, these are godly people, he says, I learn resurrection different. He goes, because they interact with resurrection so much differently than I do. Because it is such a more immediate hope for them. And he goes, and I've had to learn that I should have their perspective. And I went, ooh, that's really good. Because I'm starting to straddle that line a little bit. That's a good thought. But the future resurrection matters to me because there can be this sense of loss. Because, you know, I can't keep up with my kids the same way I used to. Things are different. People who I loved have moved on and died. So is it just loss? Is it just a sense of hopelessness of it's not going to get better anymore? Well, if this is all there is, yeah. It can kind of be, could get kind of depressing. But no. Oh, the fact that this doesn't work as well as it used to. I ain't at the end of my story at all. There's a future coming. And it's a future of restoration. And it's going to be far beyond. I, I'm going to get back more than I'm losing. Job. Job probably thought, we don't know for sure, but Job probably thought he was going to die. I mean, all his family's dead other than his wife, and that's not working so well. He's sick. Everything he owns has been burned or captured. He's sitting on a pile of ashes and his body is failing. He's sick. He's got boils. He probably thinks this is, he's near the end. And he says, although my body rots away, yet with my eyes, and he uses the word eyes, the word he uses is for physical organs. But with my eyes, I will see my Redeemer. He knew that even though he was thought he was near his death. Turned out he wasn't. But he still knew there was a restoration coming. And it was comfort. I know that in the end I will stand and he will stand and I will see him in my flesh. And that is the meaning of resurrection. It is hope and comfort that we've got more coming. And Paul lays it out really clear. Let's close. Father, I thank you for the promise that this isn't all there is. Lord, when we're younger, we're tempted to indulge in the moment and we are tempted to invest our energies and our bodies and our resources into the treasures of this earth. They get corrupted and they get stolen and they get taken away and co-opted. And you have told us to not invest in these things that are passing away, that this whole planet is passing away. That the things that our countrymen and our friends and our neighbors and our families are oftentimes fighting for and trying to, just trying to get by are all things that are going to pass away. And you told us that it would be hard. Living here was going to be hard. This is, a, this is a fallen world full of fallen people. 
You told us it, it would be hard and there would be trouble. But that you were going to give us more. And a future and a hope. And you have. And so Lord, I pray that we will fix our eyes on the treasures of heaven. But not the misty, cloudy harps and wings mythology but the truth of your word which is that we will get a new body to live on a new heaven and a new earth that we will have a physical existence in the future but one that doesn't look anything like we have now and we won't be tired and sick and rotting away that we have hope and renewal and life and may we live our time here now in anticipation of that and especially in trying to share that good news. The good news that you came and died for us so that we could have that hope. That as we continue to exist as people, that it will matter whether we have entered into the life that you have offered all. And so Lord, that we will live our lives this week surrounded by the people who may not know that and that we will seek to wisely and lovingly and carefully share the hope that we have within us, especially that we'll be ready when they ask, why are you so hopeful? That we'll be ready to give an answer for the hope that lives in us. That we'll be able to say, because I'm not bound by sin and death, the corruption that is eating at us all. That when I fall into the ground and die, I will rise. And Lord, may that be what defines our lives day to day and defines us as a church. And as we go out and live in our community this week as the Beans Corner Church, may that be who we are. Salt and light and beacons of hope. A city on the hill that nobody can miss. Pointing towards the blessed hope of your restoration. Thank you for giving us the answers. Clearly and simply. Lord, I'm sorry it took me so long to find it. Lord, thank you for your word designed to help us know you and to be ready. Be with us throughout the rest of our day and week. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just tease next Sunday. We're going to do the next section in First Peter. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15. Because in verse 50, he says, now let me tell you what the implications are. And we're gonna, we'll have to dip into 1 Thessalonians 2. Reunion. The other part of the restoration. It's going to be exciting. Until then, remember all the different things that we've got coming up. If, you wanna, if you're looking to get baptized, come talk to me. Uh, we will be at some point this spring doing a membership class if you're interested in that. Uh, if you're uh, interested in helping with shepherding, come talk to me and we'll have a discussion and uh, music and child care. Other than that, uh, we're done for the day. Joel is going to try to dismiss you to get us to Carngate outside, not in here. Uh, if there's some sharing I still don't want to do, uh, which is your germs, your rot. <laughs> but hey, it's great to see you today. Have a great day. I love you.